uh, let's see, uh, as we're doing test driven development, uh, we start with the test. Uh, we are using, let's see, just go to the presentation mode here. Tests here, test the whole component, the whole uh, currency, web app. Uh, we have a spot test, of course, uh, the jet. And we have like uh, this this method here, test that the most used currencies is correct. And here's the list that should be shown. And now we want to remove the Turkish Lira. And if now run the test. Uh, here we're packing it up, packing, packaging the application together, and it will take some time. And then after that, we're starting the application inside the test for the test runs. Like this in a live demo, I just forgot I had to fetch the latest code from uh, production or from the, my, my Git repo, and uh, I had time to compile it all before. So it probably takes a little bit more time than I wanted. Yeah, we also had some merge conflicts uh, like two minutes before the presentation started, so uh, hmm? it's exciting to see if it's actually good. Starting the, the application. And, uh, soon we will be starting the test. Yes, there we're starting. And, yeah, let's see. We got the Spock output that says that the most used currencies on the page includes Ticketera, but uh, we don't want that. So, okay, then we switch to the unit test, which is in JavaScript. Uh, yes, and then we have uh, the same list here. And remove the Turkish Lira. Then try to run the test. This is the unit that's written in JavaScript. Yeah. Because the uh, actual version code for the uh, that's holds this list is in JavaScript. Yeah, that fails to fail too, <coughs> as expected. And then we just have to fix the production code. Of these currencies, remove the Turkish Lira. And then hopefully the test will go green, the unit test. And this one, yeah, just have to run it. I'm not sure why, but, uh, and then we'll see if the uh, uh, component test, module test, will go for it. Again, we have to package up the application. Uh, hopefully, it will take a little bit shorter now because we're running Gradle, which is quite good at checking what, what needs to be done. Then I can just uh, 
Yeah, just gonna, yeah, just commit it. I'm about to fix those colors. Okay, and then we just push it. Then we're done. Then we have just have to wait for uh, the continu continuous integration server and the pipeline to go through. So then we'll continue with the presentation. Like you want to deploy every week, you want to have to deploy That's the 
five months. Um, we're going to tell a little bit about that today, how it works, and how we how it was made possible. So, <laughs> yes. Okay. So, by the tester development, what do we get? Biggest reasons are we can deploy a lot safer and more faster. Uh, Fin Travel does about 40 deploys a day. Uh, Fin has done that by the tester development. Uh, and if you and you don't have to be afraid when doing large span changes like several changing several modules at the time. Because if the test is called green, everything's okay. And we found that uh, test development leads to good design. I know not everyone agrees on this, but it was uh, uh, what happened with us. And if you have a Create a nice testable architecture which you get when you do test driven development. You most likely have a good and easy uh, changeable architecture. Easy to reason about. Okay, so we test everything. I mean everything. Uh, the build that every developer, developer uses runs every test, every code check, whatever. Uh, one thing for sure is that you don't want another build that runs the tests. Uh, I've seen that. Uh, if you do that, if the, if the tests go red, no one really cares after a while. But we don't really test everything. No, we, have, we haven't got 100% test coverage. That would be quite a challenge and not really good in any way. So we don't want to test everything, but sorry, we do want to test everything, <laughs> but we want to do it with, a, with, a, with a, as few tests as possible. And Martin Fabri came, came up with this pyramid, test pyramid, uh, which shows the different test types, uh, from exploratory testing, manual style, uh, down to end-to-end -end tests, component integration, and unit tests. And by having, having tests in, on different levels, uh, you get test coverage on different things. Like, for example, you can't really test two components for each. Uh, test how two components talk to each other. Uh, with a unit test. Another important thing is that the number of tests, which should be like for the end-to-end uh, -end test, you should have few that test only the half paths. And when you go down, downwards, you get more and more tests that test more and more uh, error conditions and uh, exceptional stuff. And the reason for having fewer end-to-end tests are that they are slow, harder to automate, and uh, then th that does not scale. Uh, actually, we are not using all the, all the, all the levels. We're just using uh, the end-to-end -end tests, component tests, and unit tests. And another reason uh, for having uh, different levels is that unit tests, they make the internal quality better, like high, qu high, high quality code, uh, code looks better, while the end-to-end -end test makes the external quality better. That is, it, it's usable for the user. Uh, when it comes to end-to-end -end tests, uh, we have we call them feature tests. For us, they start up the whole application, all the components like uh, front end, API, integration, and uh, database or whatever. And the test, they emulate, emulate the user. 
So they like fill out the forms, click uh, links, and then checks that this uh, page looks like it should. And we are mocking out external services. Like for the flight search, <laughs> we mock out Xperia, uh, uh, Air France, and uh, other stuff. And this is done to make the test go faster, to have it more stable. So if, the, if an external service goes down, we don't the test doesn't fail. And then the component test. Uh, then we want to start up uh, one of the components in an application. For example, web or the API. And if, if it's a web, web component, uh, we do the test uh, the same way as in the end-to-end test, so that is emulate a user. But if it's uh, another component, like an API, using the exposed API, uh, that, the, uh, uh, that means the API that the component exposes in the test. And uh, for component, component tests, uh, you're mocking out all the external depend dependencies and all other components that the component is using. This makes the test actually tests the component and not how the other external dependencies uh, works. We're using some tools to do this. Uh, first is Spock. If you haven't tried it, try it. It's very good. It makes the test uh, a lot easier to read, more concise. And for uh, front-end tests, we are using Jeb, which is awesome, and to get the pocket even better. And we have some JavaScript in the front end, which we test with the Karma. Uh, this, run, uh, this starts a browser, uh, which, uh, which you are running your tests in. Locally, we are using PhantomJS, which is headless uh, mm -hmm. and faster. Than, uh, than the, like starting up Chrome in the test. Uh, but we also use uh, Browser Stack, which is a closed service for uh, starting up all types of browsers, like IE, Internet Explorer. And we have also made some utilities, like the uh, Embedded Tomcat, which is a utility for starting up one component in a test. Uh, so we start Tomcat and deploy the component inside the Tomcat in the test before starting, starting the te testing. And we are mocking and stabbing with different tools. And we want to make code quality high, stay high. So we run code checks like PMD, Codemark, and others. And we use the same rules on both production and test code, because they think it's important that test code is uh, just, just as high quality as the production code. And we are using JSP in the front end, uh, and to make sure uh, that does compile, doesn't crash in production, we, we're test compiling it uh, in the build. And last but not least, Gradle uh, is very important for us. Uh, it makes the build go faster, and it makes it, make it a lot easier to create uh, complex builds like we have. Some examples. This is a Jet test, written in Spock, uh, which actually just goes to the login page, uh, fills in forms, and checks that, uh, and uh, click, click the login button and checks that the user are redirected to the user page. Quite concise and easy to read. We used Cucumber before instead of Jeb, but uh, as none of our product owners wrote the specs, it was just a pain in the ass to maintain. And Jeb is a lot, a lot easier. And as a little example of how we use the embedded Tomcat utility for starting and stopping. 
uh, Tomcat in the test. With, with the component inside. And we use something called the client driver for mocking out external services. Uh, which starts a mock HTTP server. Here you can uh, specify expectations and responses. And then appoint the component. If you are to it, point it to the the HTTP server instead of the real thing. Yes? Yeah, so uh, to be able to do uh, this uh, delivery, we need to have uh, this delivery pipeline. So let's have a look at how our uh, push to uh, the master works now. See how the pipeline looks. Test 
And what I think with the continuous deployment is that uh, there's always small changes that hit this, uh, the production system. You don't have big changes hitting the production system. So we have these small changes hitting the production system over time. The probability of <laughs> probability that there's a bug in there is quite small. Of course it happens. You could have a bug that goes through this process and goes into production. But in that case, it's very easy to locate because the middle, uh, or the, the deployment was so small, it's easy to locate, and it's uh, really easy to fix it. And when we fix it, like in the delivery uh, way of doing things, we do roll forward, not backwards. Since we push directly to master, and things are launching within minutes. So we never roll backwards, we always roll forward when there's a bug in production. Almost. Yeah. There has, has been some incidents where we actually wrote that. It is difficult, if, you know, if you have like schema changes and things like that, you can't just start going backwards. So you just roll things forward. And we do also rely heavily on monitoring and alerting. This is like our tests in production. Steve will talk a little bit about that later. How we do the monitoring and alerting. And we are doing no code because that means no code is right. Uh, no, that's not true because we do have, uh, before we start coding, we have the team or parts of the team before a whiteboard and uh, they plan everything and discuss and they know what they're going to do before they start implementing. This is really important. You just don't grab a task and start implementing without coding anymore. You have to kind of anchor this in the team. We also do post-production code reviews. Uh, there's, there's a kind of uh, uh, heated debate about this. Is post-production code reviews better than pre-production? There's always arguments on both sides. We prefer post-production code reviews. We think they are good and it helps us in our process. If we have big changes, we do also uh, post-production code reviews for the whole team. We gather the whole team and the person or persons that were responsible for the changes do a presentation to the rest of the team to show them what has been done. So code review them. What is it really good for? Um, absolutely nothing. Nobody cares about code reviews. It's, I mean, it just takes away the developer's time and it breaks the flow. And why do you do it really? Oh, it's such a pain. No, it's not. I was not lying. We, just, we don't usually use code reviews to find bugs because we have all these other systems that are supposed to find bugs for us, like the tests we have, the static code analysis, and uh, the discoveries we do before we uh, start implementing. So we don't primarily use code reviews for finding bugs <coughs> because that's kind of boring and tedious work. So what we do use code reviews for is to learn from your peers that it gets much more fun because you can learn something new. Now we also use it as input for refactoring. So if Steve wrote some piece of code, and I do code review, and I think this could do with some refactoring, I can use this as an input for the refactoring I'm doing. So it's, uh, it's not about finding bugs at all, it's about learning and using it as input for refactoring. And it, for our team, it really works well. Uh, and of course, none of this is possible to deploy uh, so many times a day to production without a team or, or DevOps structure. So developers have the full responsibility of the project lifecycle from coding to production. Uh, we don't have any uh, any operations department anymore, or we do have actually, that takes care of the hardware and things like that. But like for systems being in production, it's all up to the developers. If you can't fix a bug by rolling forward, you can always go into the production systems and have a look at logs or restart services or things like that. So the whole responsibility is on the developer now. You write the code, and you're also responsible for the code writing. That's kind of a change of mindset for uh, many developers. 
for our developers that are, that are trying to experience for some of them, that was kind of a big change in how they were used to be working, but now everybody embraces it and thinks this is, this is the only true way of doing things. Okay, a disclaimer is in place here. Uh, this description is just from one of the teams within the chipset. Uh, we are several hundred developers in the chipset. And I'm sure most of the teams are actually doing Google Quests. We are, the, we are one of the two teams that are not doing any Google Quests. And there are many different processes that are used by different teams. So we don't, uh, we encourage the teams to be autonomous enough to, uh, to make their own processes and what works for them works for the team. Okay, so how's that performance going now? I can tell you it's not going well. <laughs> so I'm not going to look at the pipeline anymore. Uh, and we don't need to look into production either because uh, that change is surely not going to production. But ideally, I would tell you that this change has gone into production now, and we can see that uh, the Turkish media have been removed from the most recent So, uh, I'm sorry yeah. about that, but that's like uh, the nature of a live demo, I guess. So, something about the stream, a little bit speak. You want to say something there? Yeah. So, we're not uh, regarding testing. So, we're not using d d testing just for before production. They are also very important after to make sure the site is actually working like it should. And we have quite a lot of code written explicitly for making monitoring work. Uh, here's a dashboard from uh, our Grafana in installation. And we're using um, Prometheus to, uh, to fetch the metrics from the application. And uh, we're using uh, the Elk stack or Elasticsearch log stash Kibana for uh, uh, searching through logs through the system. And we're also using Hystrix from Netflix. Uh, this is a latency and fault tolerance labor library, which we use to make sure that our external, external partners does not take on our site. For example, if uh, an external service is really slow, uh, just uh, they're just stopped, and not the external service, but we're not using it now. Uh, yeah, and also it's great, it creates a great dashboard. And when we get alerts, like this SMS, uh, that we need to go into production and check uh, on some of our components. Uh, yeah, so like, um, uh, well, a little bit from that, uh, these are really our tests in the production system. The monitoring and the monitoring system, if there's no threshold that's been broken or across, we didn't get the logs quite quickly. And it's up to the developers to actually fix this, uh, uh, this thing in the launch. In this case, it was uh, a certain server error for some reason. Uh, I'm sure it was easy to fix by some of the developers by rolling something for uh, yeah, since the live demo didn't work out that well, we're really at the end of the uh, talk. So I um, just want to say uh, a short summary. We're using test driven development um, a lot to, uh, to be able to deploy to production several times a day. Continuous delivery pipelines uh, is essential for this. Um, we're, not, uh, we're not deploying into any. Uh, any uh, cloud formation or anything like that yet, but that's uh, something we're working on. For microservices in the cloud, it's a uh, nice big step for us. Uh, we'll hopefully, yeah, we'll work on that at the moment. DevOps, the developers need to change the mindset and uh, embrace the, the Unix command line and be able to, to run commands in the terminal. No, 
requests are working for us. It's not working for everyone. I'm sure there are different opinions on that in this group. Uh, I, I don't think we would be able to force the developers to go back to using the request now when they have actually started not using the request and just push changes that are fantastic. And of course, monitoring is really, really important here. If you don't do the monitoring right, you don't really know what's happening. <coughs> um, that's basically we're actually hiring, so I'm currently working with most of the team here in Barcelona at the moment that's uh, developing uh, services for uh, uh, some of the 30 markets you saw on that uh, second slide there. So if you are if you're interested, uh, grab one of us uh, in uh, the t-shirts. Uh, unfortunately, we have, we have the same colors as the, uh, the staff here today. <laughs> you can see the difference by the, the white color. You also know the direction to the toilet, so if you ask me about that, we can <laughs> uh, drive in the right direction as well. Uh, yeah, <coughs> are there any questions? So, please ask it. Yeah. The example you gave, the live demo, was a very, very basic change. That's all fine, your system for making small changes. What about that change you have to do every few months that's a major change to code so that you can have some new feature? How does that go with this system? Yeah, that's true. I forgot to mention that we are heavily using feature toggling in production. So you're using feature toggling in production. So uh, we do put uh, code into the production that's not really uh, live yet. So by using feature toggling, we have a, uh, a known framework called, called Unleash that's I think it's open source. Right? Yeah, it's open source. Uh, so we're using that to uh, be able to kind of still have the, the, the process of small changes into the production system. So when we have all the changes, the big changes into the production system, we do uh, the, the toggle, the feature toggle, and uh, things are live. Yeah, um, we are lucky to have not have too much data in a database that is that is uh, what do you, you say that don't. We're more or less a stateless system because we're just uh, fetching data from external providers and sending them on the fly. So if the data is like ten minutes old, it's all uh, done. Yeah, but we yeah, but we yeah, but we do. Uh, we, we have done like schema changes, and uh, then we have to just like do it so we can roll it forward all the way. So we just add a field. If you uh, if you want to rename a, a column or something like that, you just add the column and uh, push it out. Uh, change it to use a new column and then push it out and yeah. Well. Yeah, so you have to. That's more steps in order. We are using mostly uh, uh, fields that are not, not uh, do not have to be filled out. Uh, what do you call it? It's uh, uh, no, yes, stored or not stored. I don't remember the name for it. But we haven't had, had any problem with that uh, anyway. So, but um, as I said, we are lucky to have a system that doesn't really need to store the data for a long time. We, we are batch importing data for some of the uh, some of the verticals, and for the fly search that, that's live, so we don't have uh, 
the data is stored for like half an hour. So every search is uh, every search a user does is uh, fetching data from the external partners. So we don't have any databases uh, with a lot of data that is stored for a long time. So that's make it makes it a lot easier. Yeah. So it's kind of an easy system to do uh, this kind of process with that when it comes to the virtual stack with the questions. You say that there are people talking about the information in some models. So, when you do the work, doesn't mean that we need to load some libraries and so on? Or is it about the amount of information? Sorry, once more? Sorry, once more? Yeah, I say that you say that we are not working on that. This is not that it's mostly a monolithic application. Hmm. Yeah, you will ask the patient, they don't need to change either a type of Downtime, yeah. Uh, 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 our application is like uh, we have several web apps, uh, several uh, web apps that talk to each other, like uh, front end web uh, integration and stuff. And um, they are deployed to several servers, several servers. So uh, when a new version is, is in, in going into production, uh, half of the servers or half of the servers for one component is taken down. And then new ones deployed, and then the other half is taken over and deployed. So we really, really don't have enough downtime uh, for that. We had a problem uh, earlier with Solar because when we had to change the schema, uh, the only way to do that with Solar was to take Solar down and up again. But with the Solar Cloud, which we are using now, uh, we can just push the schema changes to, to Kipper and just tell uh, Solar to uh, load there. So we don't, then we don't have to <coughs> restart the Solar.